Hello, welcome to Scary Thoughts, Horror, Philosophy, Culture. I'm Mark Kate, And I'm Chad Lott. This is episode 96. We're going to be talking about Dune, the Denis Villeneuve film from 2021. And probably a lot of David Lynch's version, maybe the sci-fi made for TV one, which no one really thinks very much of, and definitely Jodorowsky's n- unmade Dune film. You can email us at what the W H A T T H E at scarythoughts.org. And I think the only thing to say is spoilers ahead. I, is there any? Yeah, I would say uh, spoilers just for anything that appears in the first book would be there. And then uh, two other points, which I'm going to mention now that Duncan Dida- Idaho comes back as a clone later. That's all we'll say later in the series of books. And that eventually the emperor becomes a giant worm. And that's it as far as past the first book. Cool. Yeah. So why are we covering Dune on this horror podcast? It was just requested by a ton of people. Like tons of people wanted to know about it and uh, what we thought about it. And for the new film, most of what I have to say is I really loved it. I thought it was great. I don't have many complaints about it. it. It's just, you know, it is, I think, in the way that Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films were the definitive versions of those. I think this is going to be the definitive version of this story. Although, David Lynch did so much heavy lifting. Like, there's so many concepts from his version of the film that I think you see in this version of the film. Like, just basically the plot points. Like, the things that David Lynch pulled out from the book to sort of frame the story for film Maybe they're just the natural things that you would pull out. But, um, you know, this version of him doesn't go too into too much of a different territory. And they're both fairly faithful to the book, especially this version. This version, uh, Denis Villeneuve said that he, you know, that he loved these books. Like the, he's very into this and his career ambition was to make this film one day. And he did. And uh, one of the things he talked about, which I really, liked was he talked about how he wanted to make the film that his uh how did he say it his his pretentious arrogant totalitarian teen self would have liked and i i totally that's a vibe that i could totally relate to as a teenager and i think he really succeeded with this film doing that yeah when's the last time you read the book Uh, about a week ago oh (laughs) and i've read it countless times i've probably read it 10 or 15 times uh, it may be the first sci-fi book I read that wasn't a Star Wars adaptation or Star Wars novel or something like that. Right. Yeah. I've never read it. I saw the Lynch version probably back when it was live on TV and not since. Yeah. It's, you know, some people who are just coming to this movie fresh, I've seen comments like, oh, it feel there's things that they think feel derivative or like derivative to Star Wars. But the reality is like Star Wars is a very poor ripoff of Dune in a lot of ways. Like like Dune came first. I mean, obviously it's in the 60s, so it's not golden age sci-fi by any means. And there's that conversation going on right now about when sci-fi started and people are saying it's uh, Jules Verne or some shit like that. And it's kind of erased Mary Shelley. But it's even there's even older versions than that. So like the idea that you're going to put plant the stake at Mary Shelley, like who I think modern sci-fi for sure kicks off with her. But you know, there's like older weird Indian Upanishad stuff that is definitely sci-fi-ish. Yeah, I think that. Uh, oh God, I don't even know where I was going with that. Uh, fuck. <laughs> Man, you seem super super stoked on this one. Um, so you're not like, are you really much of a sci-fi fan in general? Like, do you like to catch all the new sci-fi shit that comes out? I don't. I, I am very, in a certain way, invested in sci-fi. I'm not invested in hard sci-fi in any way. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to come out the gate on this episode being too much of a naysayer. But I have to be frank that I don't care about space opera. I don't mm-hmm. care about worlds conquering worlds uh that's not the type of sci-fi that draws me in i don't care about star wars i don't care about dune i don't care about harry potter i don't care about lord of the rings i don't care about these Mm -hmm. these heroes journeys that are these to my mind cookie cutter heroes journeys that are about chosen men 
destiny, worlds, so that's, monarchies. So yeah, so that's the big. None like, of it. A I, lot I just, of people. I just fucking can't say. And that's not a political stance. Yeah, I've never cared about this. Stuff. A lot of people don't like Dune because they think it's like just another one of those. But I would say it's one of the. I mean, there's definitely probably some older sci-fi book that I'm not thinking of from like the 1940s, but it has all those things. But it's also simultaneously critical of all of them. So like you'll you'll you know the uh, the nine volt brain critique you'll see of this film or Dune in general, especially this version of the film, is that it is like a white savior story. You know, like where like you know, colonialism comes and steps all over the the sad brown people of some destitute place, and yes. you know. And that is true that does happen, but Frank Herbert, who I'm going to keep calling Frank A. Bear because Herbert is pronounced A. Bear in Louisiana, um, <laughs> <laughs> so just forewarning. And if anybody's bothered by that, I I honestly just don't care. You know, just I'm just gonna you know. I'm just gonna take the moment when you said Herbert and copy and paste the audio over every time you pronounce it your way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, that's not very Canadian of you. You should accept my pronunciation. I'm sure it's probably how they say it in Montreal. I don't know. But like, hey, bear. That's probably true. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and since Denis Villeneuve is from Montreal, yeah. it sounds just like George St. Pierre. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think my way is the way. Anyway, this book sets up this, like, by the book, White Savior, right? But... As the story progresses in the series, especially in the second book, you it becomes very clear that that is a very bad thing because basically he starts this space jihad, and what he is and how he is what he is causes all the problems. So it's sort of he's anticipating and commenting on that at the same mm. time, and then he's also doing kind of interesting things with like the people of Arrakis, the Fremen. Their whole culture is invented by the Bene Gesserit, basically. Like, they're religious. It's like, it's planted there. So he has this kind of interesting take on stories, which is sort of Jungian but cynical. I guess you could, like, probably cram this story into the hero with a thousand faces, like, hero's journey beats. But it also sort of doesn't really follow that, those beats. So far it does. It's, the movie we've seen, this first Dune Part 1 movie that I have seen is... Literally, like, some guy, it is destined, he hasn't earned shit, and now he's the leader of, he's, he's so, bound to be the leader of the So universe. I totally disagree with that. Because <laughs> I think what, what's happening is something a little bit different when he's not, so he's not supposed to be, like, the Messiah. Like, the Bene Gesserit are engineering this, that's their whole thing, is they've been, like, engineering bloodlines for thousands of years, crossing lines to try and create this character that is like a messiah that they can control because they're like this crazy witch cult and then his mother is like out of nowhere like he wants a son i'll you know use my witch uterus to give him a son yeah and so he becomes this sort of like glitch in their system um but he is not like like a luke skywalker or harry potter figure that's just like roaming around doesn't know what's going on until he runs into a mentor that like saves him and elevates him he is he has all the military training. He has all the Mintat training. He has all the witch training. So he's basically like has every advantage you could possibly have. And then he's put into this situation where a character with all those advantages would be able to take advantage of the free, the Fremen's uh engineered belief system. And those two things together on this like impossibly violent planet create this like sort of like powder keg that manifests this like ubermensch type character. So I think it's it's different than the hero's journey. I think the hero's journey is for the most part kind of lazy. This is a little bit different because I think if you dig into it, it's a little bit more challenging than that. All right. Yeah. But I'm deeply invested in this book series and the story. <laughs> how I, many of the how many of the series books have you read? I've read all the Frank uh, A Bear versions. Um, Frank who? Uh, A Bear. I, I think uh, <laughs> when he. I think after he dies, yeah. I, I have heard that his son picked it up and did a very good job. Yeah, um, I don't care about that. And to me, it would be like like I think Sean Lennon sucks. I love the Beatles. Whoa, you know, like <laughs> like I'm just not interested in passing the torch yeah. generationally. Yeah, writing is just so like why would you be good at picking it up and like maybe if you had like access to certain notes or something like that. And then I don't, even though I hear that they're pretty cool, 
I haven't read any of the like extended universe books that other people wrote. Yeah, yeah. So just the core six. I mean, I like Joe Hill's books better than I like Stephen King's books. That's crazy so. to me. Well, I could see, I could understand how you could see that. I think the best Stephen King stuff is the stuff that nobody thinks of as Stephen King, like Rita, Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption mm. is fucking great. Yeah. I, I, I would say it might be, I mean, I'm just going to have to nod the stand is the best one, but I think maybe better is that. And maybe even, I would put the Green Mile up there too. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about this as a movie. Yeah. I'm not into the source material. I feel kind of mm. left slightly cold by it, but there's a lot about it as a movie that I actually really loved. I, I really mm. do like Denis Villeneuve. Uh, Arrival's one of my favorite movies, like no yeah. question. Blade Runner 2046. Um, 2049. Is it 2049? 2049 Holy yeah. shit. Um, I really, really dug that movie. And in fact, if I had a choice to watch the original or that movie, you know, later tonight, I would pick the newer version. I I like the look of the newer version yep. better. I it's mean, great. obviously, it's completely indebted to the look of the previous version. Oh, yeah. And I think it's just uh, technically as a movie, what he does with light is completely interesting, like naturalistic lighting. Absolutely. Um, there's a really fun like video you can find, which is uh, special effects dorks react to Dune special effects or something like that, and they kind of <laughs> compare the David Lynch special effects with this, and they they just talk about like a ton of stuff that I didn't even know. Like it's all shot outside, basically. Yeah. Like and, instead of having green screens, they have these weird sand, sand colored screens. sand screens. Yeah. yeah, and they're kind of like. Um, one of the cinematographers on this film shot the whole first season or most of the first season of The Mandalorian. And they, they're now using that weird like kind of wraparound, not green screen, but it's yeah. like it's a... It's like rear projection, yeah. but it's in the round. So yeah. you're getting reflections of the actual environment. Yeah, and it's hitting the, the actors with light yeah. from the thing. So they're actually better. reacting to something. They're not just in a green studio... Yeah, staring at ping pong balls on strings. It's a major step up. I mean, you, I think it's one of the reasons why The Mandalorian feels real yep. a little bit. Uh, even though I'll never watch it again, it can go fuck itself. But that's what this movie has. It has like this realism that comes through lighting, and it's not like realism because it's gritty. Like, though that helps. Yeah. Well, there's a grittiness to it, but it's like uh, there's a lot of movies that are sort of like post Christopher Nolan's Batman mm -hmm. that are like. They're just grimy, yeah. and they still look like shit. Like a bunch of the Marvel films are kind of like that, you know. And all the DC movies, pretty mo almost. Yeah, like one of the things I really like is like when there's an expl like in the the main battle scene when there's an explosion, it like washes out the characters in the foreground, and they're only black, and and so it has this just you know like your eye looks at it like it's real, yeah, which is just so much cooler than uh, pretty much most sci-fi movies that are made. Pretty much most Marvel movies. Yeah. Where there's just this complete oversaturation of visual information and mm -hmm. it becomes such a wash that it I find it oftentimes unexciting. Um, yeah. But I think that the strategy that Villeneuve is in a sense doing uh, that I really appreciate is he's bringing a certain kind of minimalism mm -hmm. to his it, it's sort of a maximalism minimalism like if we take the lucasfilm revisions of uh star wars the worst uh, a new hope it, it's so insulting but he's filling every corner of every frame mm -hmm. with something exciting yeah. and it becomes less exciting than just a big open field with negative space yeah and Villain of Almost does the opposite, where so much of his cinematography is ultra minimal, lots of negative space, and these long, languorous shots. They're like traditional shots that you might see in Lawrence of Arabia. Fully. Like they're just like desert shots. They, the camera doesn't do weird CGI spinning around. Yes. Which is wonderful. A lot of heli like traditional heli shots, like the helicopter shots. Yep. Yeah, uh, there's obviously so much that is possible through CGI at this point with high-budget films. And I appreciate that he's, of course, using CGI, but mm -hmm. he is using it 
not to make everything super saturated with excitement, yeah. but to create compelling cinematography and to complete the idea and really trying to be faithful to a certain sense of realism of this is how this would look if you were there. And that, that comes back to what you were similar to what you were saying with like the explosions, like that's what an explosion looks like, even mm -hmm. if it's fake um, as opposed to um, just making an explosion in the background and having actors pretend something happened. Yeah. I think the costumes are really well thought out too. Like, well, I, I think that for great. me is one of the worst parts of the movie. Really? But yeah, definitely. I, I'm, but go uh, but go ahead, Con huh. convince me. <laughs> well, if you think like all the armor that the, mm -hmm. like in particular the Atreides land with, it's all clearly like medieval inspired. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, part of what's interesting about it is it, to, I, I haven't seen this anywhere, but it's, there were stories of when medieval knights went on the crusades and they ended up in the desert, their shit was just completely ridiculous. And it <laughs> has that feel like when you're like, you're showing up and you're like, Perry, this filthy casual, but it's like a thousand degrees outside. <laughs> like, yeah. just, so there's that feel I think is really interesting. And then some things that I, I didn't pick up on, but I read like the Atreides costumes are all based on Romanoff costumes, which I think is really interesting because, you know, they're the last czars and they die and mm. like that. And I, I think it's, I think the David Lynch costumes are much better. Like I, I like them for their weirdness that's, yeah. and their strangeness. I think as cool as the Benny Jesuits in this film look, they're not terrifying. Like I like the bald headed weird Benny Jesuits. Um, I like the guild navigator being represented as this weird fetal creature that looks like it could be related to the child from Eraserhead in the first David Lynch. Yeah. You know, there's this, uh, there's this actually really funny article that's like 10 things David Lynch needed, needlessly added to Dune. And it's, the 10 most awesome things. It's like the Mintat's eyebrows, the heart plugs, the cat that gets milked, uh, the the black suits that the Navigator's Guild helpers are wearing, uh, which are actually used body bags from the county morgue that they just turned into costumes. Yeah. And then um, I, I will say I think the still suits and the Fremen look a lot cooler in this than in David Lynch's version. What are what are still suits? It's the suits that the Fremen wear that everybody oh, okay. wears to survive in the desert. It's basically right. a combination um, water fountain porta potty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thought that the costume of the guy who's watering the date palms that's a good costume. Mm -hmm. And then there are these. Um, it's sort of very classic uh, illustration of what Dune is supposed to look like that I think I've seen. It might even be from old pulp paperback mm -hmm. copies. But uh, these big domes, I found, considering how amazing the uh, cinematography was and the lighting and the choreography and the score, that the costumes were peculiarly unimaginative. They hmm. were they they seemed they seemed almost all of them just seemed like yep that's someone wearing leather combat gear yeah i will like, say is this how far we've come well as much as i loved it none of it was unexpected so i think you're right like it's the type of stuff that you've just seen in the concept art yep. for the last 50 years yes you know so it's not none of it was like the david lynch stuff was just some of it was just breaking new ground yeah. it was just totally like the, the mentats that with their spice they have the spice stains all over their faces right. which i think is really cool it, the Harkonnens are just so weird and perverted in David Lynch's version. They're just like slimy, uh, which I think is cool. I mean, in this version you have, I think the Harkonnens are awesome. I think Skarsgård plays Baron Harkonnen in a very cool way, but yeah. it's clearly Apocalypse Now, yes. Marlon Brando. For sure. Uh, which is... I think that's fine. That's fine, you know, because this movie, a lot of the... I think the the color cues and a lot of the equipment has a very Afghan war war sort of. I mean, obviously that's the twenty year war that we've been in, and I don't mind that at all. I, I think it's interesting. I I wish I could have seen Afghanistan or Iraq up close. Like I think it would. Like I love the desert. I think as a landscape, it's my favorite landscape. Yeah. And you know, I've I've seen some people comment about how dull, flat, and cold 
this movie is hmm. only if you think the desert is dull, flat, and cold. <laughs> I mean, there's so many beautiful textures and interesting yeah. things, and all of the uh, the Arab inspired art and and tapestries in this film are just incredible to me. But I, I also love that stuff in the real world too. Yeah. What do you think about the acting in general? I think the acting is really good. I think that there is a bit of um, one complaint I have is that although I really deeply appreciate Hans Zimmer's score and I appreciate Hans Zimmer in general, I think that it was overused and I think that was sometimes to the detriment of the actors because when you have a dramatic scene and there is this really interesting, unique, cutting edge score running mm-hmm. underneath it. It, I don't want to say it takes away from the actors, but I think cumulatively, because so many scenes in this film, how do, how do I, I, I want to, I want to say this clearly, but oftentimes the further you, Oftentimes, I, I'm not saying this is a rule, the further you get away from two people on a stage talking to each other, mm. the harder it is to really sink into an actor's performance. Not always, but often. And this movie is layers of like costuming, cinematography, special effects, uh, this really exotic, unique soundtrack all these bizarre sound cues, tons of atmosphere. And so I think that it makes the skills of the actors very hard to access some of the time. And I think that the film for, for my taste suffers for it. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think the movie suffers for it, but I think that I perhaps would have um, cared about this movie more if I could sink into the characters more but I always found I was sort of uh, visiting these characters' experience through 10 layers of uh, cinematic artifice. That's almost how the book is to the characters. Like, there's just so much sense. going on. Sure. Like, I thought everybody did a great job as an actor in this film. No one's going home with an Oscar. You know what I mean? That, like, like, yes. it, it, it's like, there's nobody who is at fault. I thought even Jason Momoa, who I love, but I'm always, like, kind of, like, cringed on like like no he's great yeah i thought he was cool yep he's believable as this like lancelot character yeah and i think timothy chalamet the fact that he's so interesting to look at on film like that's the thing all these people in this film are very interesting to look at they all have faces like i think zendaya who i've only seen in the spider-man movies and she's okay she just seems like a bratty kid who's she she's the the girl the Fremen woman that gets the drop on him at the end that later becomes his oh, wife. Oh, yeah. The director has said that the next film will be from her perspective, which I think could be awesome. Like, it's definitely not how it is in the book, but I love when a story is, like, like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, I think is totally. fucking awesome. I, I love that. And this is basically Space Hamlet. So if you had, if he took this, like, this first half of the the story is so like i mean it's so close to the book like there's a few little things that happen differently like the the order of events around duncan idaho's death are like a little bit different like leet kinds is a woman instead of a man i think that's it totally doesn't change anything at all like it doesn't it doesn't matter there's some of that stuff but i think if they he did like hey here's a totally different look at this story through a completely different lens of this character like looking at Paul as this, because he sort of becomes a monster, basically. And then you get a little bit of that in the last, like, 40 or 50 pages of the book where all of his friends that he's been at war with the Harkonnens with for, like, years, when he becomes, like, the Kwisak Haderach for real, they all change around him, and he's no longer Paul. And Chani sort of, like, is like, well, fuck, we just kind of lost him. He became this, you know, Jihad monster. And I think that would be cool to explore that in the second version yeah for second half rather i think also going back a little bit to what i was saying mm-hmm. earlier as my experience of watching this movie reminded me of when i was young and i saw willow for the first time mm-hmm. and you're just blown away by how awesome mad mardigan was i don't know who that is but i'm pretty confident no 
so obviously this is a long time ago, so I, I might be misremembering, but I remember a scene where they're just like walking through the woods mm-hmm. and the soundtrack is, dun, 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 dun. it's just this aggressive mm-hmm. fucking propulsive music. And I was just like, they're just walking through the woods. Why am I being assaulted with this symphony? Just let them walk through the woods. I think that was the first time when I was young that I really recognized when a score was undermining a movie. Yeah. And, uh, Again, I love the Hans Zimmer score, and a lot of it is incredibly minimal, but it's not restrained. It's, it's again, all the aesthetics, even though they are incredibly minimal, uh, even its minimalism is heavy-handed. I mean, this is a loud-ass soundtrack. I mean, it is yeah. right in your face. and Even when I, it's just like a drone with some like gravelly texture behind it. It's it's fucking like really happening to you as a viewer and a listener. Yeah, like um, when you have like Sardaukar throat singing Skrillex up there, <laughs> it's just so <laughs> dialed to ten, and you're like, yeah. holy shit! And then that scene, which reminds me so much of the uh, the tortured Mortys protecting the one Rick from Rick and Morty, like when they have all the oh, Mortys God. that are like it's, it's like the same f- scene. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh. But like I, but this, this if there is a space opera, this is the space opera, and I think that it's kind of appropriate for this film. Okay, yeah, sure. One thing I would recommend if people dig this movie and are into the score is uh, Hans Zimmer was on the most recent podcast episode of uh, Song Exploder, mm. and something I really appreciated about him is he seemed more interested in talking about his collaborators than about himself. Mm. It seemed to be mostly about him like, Oh, I got to work with this person. They sent me this and I got to work with this person and they sent me that. And this person is a genius. And he really sort of positioned himself as this conduit for all these amazing artists that he has the good fortune to be able to work with, which I, you know, that warmed my heart because he's obviously an amazing person and clearly very good at that. Yeah. Like Madonna. Oh my God. Right? Well, <laughs> she like the Sardaukar drinks the blood of her enemies to stay powerful. <laughs> so I guess there's some Dune connection there. So what, what am I missing? Like I don't, I don't, again, I, I did not dislike this movie. I actually was totally engaged. There's so much about it that I really loved. But literally, as soon as the credits hit at the end, I was like, that was kind of silly. I mean, this is a real, I think, a film for real fans of Dune. Like, and, and there's so much that's just not explained yeah. that, is, that is present. I did have to pause it and look at the Wikipedia art, article to even know what the plot was. Well, when I was like about 40 minutes in, and Monique and I were like, I have no idea what's happening. And there seems to be not much plot yet. Yeah, in the time before the internet, <laughs> uh, when David Lynch's version came out, there was a pamphlet that was presented to you when you walked into the film. With It was basically a glossary. And explain to you things that you were not going to see on the, on the screen or were like just passed over really quickly. Like the entire reason why the Atreides are even going to Dune is just like breezed over in like 10 seconds, like in the first part of it. It's like Chan- Chani's uh, monologue at the very beginning about mm-hmm. how, and you don't really understand what's happening. That's like a Game of Thrones level plot that's happening yeah. there like it, like once it's walked out through the whole thing even in the fir- even in the first book there's just so much going on like that the Atreides are, are, are a rising family and the emperor could possibly lose control of the entire imperium if any of these families got too powerful and so he makes a deal with the Harkonnens to sort of like back away he's going to give the Atreides this planet which is potentially going to make them richer than ever before, but it's also going to completely destabilize them. And then he's going to back the Harkonnens to go back and kill. I don't think it's totally clear in the in this film to like a casual that all the Sardaukar are the imper- are the imperial troops, and they're not supposed to be. The there. only thing I understood of everything you just said is I yeah. understood the word unclear. There, I mean, there's just a bunch going on. I mean, it's it, it it's not clear like why the spice is important. And there's an entire 
like because it gets you high and makes space travel possible. Yeah, people get high on worm shit, and so they can go around. But but you're like, okay, well, why why is that necessary? Why don't they have computers? Well, thousands of years ago, there's this thing called the Butlerian Jihad, and they created some sort of AI, and it was going to go all Skynet, and there was a war, and the group that won became the empire of this space thing. And there's like, and the other thing that's interesting about this is there's no aliens. Like there, there are only humans in, in this like 10,000. There's 10, one scuttling pet. So that's kind of an interesting character. I have, I have heard that that is a nod to a character from uh, Jodorowsky's Metabarons. It's like, there's like this spider kind of creature, but there's a, a subset. They're not Benny Gesserits. I can't remember what they are, but there are another like, significant sect in the world of this film and they make like bioengineered people but everything is a human so that makes that thing even creepier it's not it's not an alien right but like there's all this shit like it's in every version of this book has like a glossary at the end of it you know it's so complicated right which i totally respect Mm -hmm. but it also is not that far from the fan servicing of spider-man fans see i just dis- so i i understand what you're saying there what i would say is this is all like self-contained and i think to really have enjoyed this book you would have needed to fall into it as like a teenager probably and yes. and also knowing and at a time when there wasn't like amazing video games um, like there there are sci-fi video games now that are great as any sci-fi movie that's ever been made like there's just like i watch people play like escape this isn't really sci-fi but games like escape from tarkov are so fucking cool like you might not want to just r- obsessively reread a science fiction novel from the <laughs> 60s now you know, but in a way it's like almost like um like ulysses or Moby Dick or something. I mean, I wouldn't say that this is on the level of Moby Dick by any means. Careful. <laughs> but it's it's the sort of thing that you could read and reread and you find these connections. And especially if you're curious about the cultures that kind of inspired it, there's tons of Islamic references. There's tons of Jewish references. There's like even a little bit of Native American shit in there. And then all the ecology stuff is totally fascinating because he was, uh, Abraham was an ecologist or at least had interest in it. Uh, specifically desert ecology there's just a lot you know and and some people don't like his writing style i i actually really like it it he talks about how being a photographer inspired or at least his son talks about how he would like to just take nature photos and when you do that you're just thinking about this one thing and there's all this descriptive shit that you can observe and so he would describe things like that as if he was looking at it like a camera so sometimes sometimes it feels a little overexplained. I think it's really quite beautiful. But I again, I'm all in on this. Yeah. Tell me what you disliked about it, about the movie. Um, where are its flaws. Let's see what did I dislike about it? Hmm. This is sound sounds super weird, but it's just like it's exactly as I imagined it to be. It's like when you see a resto mod car and it's done perfectly. Yep. It's not as interesting as like something that somebody took a chance on. You know, I, I think probably if Jodorowsky had been able to make his version of Dune, it probably would have been my favorite version of it. Oh, for sure. Like, I, I think a film, it's the problem with source material like this, is you, you can basically go, you can make the thing as it's supposed to be. And I don't think anybody's ever going to do it better than him. And it's the reason why the the series, the sci-fi series is lame, is it's just, it doesn't take any chances either. And it has a shitty budget and everybody involved isn't as talented. So it's it's just lesser. And it's why I think, I don't want to say David Lynch's version is a better film. I mean, he's clearly like kind of disavowed it. And, you know, it was it was not the film for its time. But I think it does... For, for its time, it does way more interesting things than this film does. So I think it doesn't take a lot of chances. Uh, the guys from Infinite Worlds talked about how it wasn't psychedelic enough. And I would kind of agree with that a little bit. Like there's, I like that the flashbacks and stuff have dream logic. Like for example, when he dreams about Jamis, the guy he duels at the end, they're friends. And then he tries to kill him. So right. like the, like I like how there's that slippery dream logic. But it doesn't, 
Yeah, it doesn't get weird enough, I think. It would be my main yeah, complaint. Yeah, I mean, their, their dream sequences or the, halluc- uh, the dreams and the hallucinations are pretty tame. Yeah, super tame. Um, I would also say that something you brought up earlier, the potential complaint that we've seen this through Star Wars, mm-hmm. yet this is actually the source material. I would say this isn't the source material. Herbert's Dune was the source material, and that shit's been mined for decades, Mm -hmm. and now we're getting the definitive version of this old book. And yes, it it kind of matches your imagination of what it could be, but so much has happened since Star Wars. Yeah, it's like you can see like a really perfect stage production of Hamlet that was done by the books, and you can resurrect every single, in their prime, Shakespeare and Company actor, and I don't think it would be as cool as some off-Broadway weirdo version where people are painted up in like Marilyn Manson costumes and shit. Like, right. I, I think that that would be better. Because, you know, it's not so hard to talk about this movie and talk about 2001 A Space Odyssey. Mm-hmm. I have not read the Arthur C. Clarke book, but I am going to go totally out on a limb and say that Kubrick's version takes some outrageous um, liberties, not with the source material, but manifesting what that book is. It's as different as the Clockwork Orange book is from the Clockwork Orange film. Okay, Like, great. I mean, it's been a long time since I read it or yeah. saw it, so it, I, maybe we could talk about it later or whatever. But I, I think where you're going is totally right on. Like, in the Clockwork Orange book, Alex isn't chasing a woman around with a big weird dick right iconic yeah you know this film doesn't have any of that it has none of that and it doesn't have to but because so much of this material is part of like i feel like i know a lot about dune and i've never read it and i barely remember the lynch version it's just kind of part of the tapestry of the world if you're Mm. invested in sci-fi and genre fiction and genre cinema, that it makes a lot of this interpretation kind of pre-wrote. It's kind of wrote. It's kind of pre-scripted. And that's, um, again, it doesn't have to be anything, but it's a little disappointing, Uh, especially for someone like me who is uninvested. I wanted, like, okay, what's this going to bring to me? Mm -hmm. Like, well kind of like um if i can sort of reflect what you were just saying it's like i haven't even read the book and it was kind of exactly what i was expecting you know and and i i would never put on a film i would never blame a film for its previews and i would never blame a film for its poster art but there's something that it's hard not to look at this film through the filter of there is seemingly only one movie poster for this movie Mm -hmm. and it's just the faces of all the people in it yeah no sci-fi no nothing interesting it's just like here's some actors you may have seen before dune it's like when you look at those really early star wars posters that you're just like what the fuck is this about and none like there'll be like characters or ships or whatever that aren't even in the movie and you're like (laughs) man this is cool yeah especially if you've seen some of those russian versions or the, polish yeah the polish ones are amazing fantastic the polish rosemary's baby poster <laughs> is pretty badass uh, but yeah I, I i totally agree with all that you know another thing it makes me think of is like you know you know the fighter kamaro uzman he's current usc champ he is oh. undeniably great one of the best ever to do it uh and like the klitschko brothers in boxing they were undeniably great like nobody beat them but they were sort of boring because of it, like because they were so perfect. And then you think about like a BJ Penn or a Nick Diaz. Like I, I think Nick Diaz is like lost about half of his fights now. But I will watch everything he does because it's so fucking weird and awesome. Yeah. Like this film is kind of like that. Like it's so clinical. And I, you know, I I could see that. But at the same time, it's like, I mean, I love this book so much. It's cool to see it as I imagined it. And it, it, it's kind of weird. I never had this experience with books I've read before I've seen the film. No matter how many times I read this book, I never imagined David Lynch's characters as the characters. I just <laughs> right. never did. Yeah. This last time reading it, I could totally imagine all of Denis Veneuve's characters like sort of like yeah. playing the parts of them in my mind. Yeah. 
Like I, I just, the cast, it's just so close. The casting is so good. There's a bunch of wild characters that haven't been cast for the second half of this. Yeah. Like Fade Rautha, the character that Sting played. He's the Harkonnen's nephew, Baron Harkonnen's nephew. Yeah. I think a good choice for that, uh, I read somewhere, and I totally agree with it, is the Skarsgård that played the dude in It, played yeah. Pennywise, would be yeah. perfect because there's the familial re- right. resemblance, and he's also a skinny, weird dude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the Princess Ariolina, which, I mean, any generic hot girl, <laughs> Holly, you know, she's a princess, who cares? Right. Yeah. One thing I will say that kind of is the flip side of what I was just complaining about is that this movie is kind of fucking perfect. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, there's not a shot in it that could have been, to my eyes, could have been better. There didn't seem to be any acting takes that gave me pause to think... Uh, they they could they could have taken that over. There's no Starbucks cup sitting off. <laughs> you know, there's no mistakes. Like it's a perfect. It's, it's perfect. Immaculate. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just something unfun about that. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, you know what I would say. My biggest complaint, going back to what I don't. This isn't a fun movie. Like the, and, no. And like I definitely don't need a dork ass Finn falling all over a fucking space casino like in whatever terrible recent star wars movie was like all that like goonie for kids shit yeah um but i definitely fucking hate joss whedon's shit but there's something to like the humor of firefly like i think firefly is the best thing he did sure but like there's a scene in firefly which i love which is captain mal is talking to this guy who's like, I will come back and kill you. And he's like, okay. And he just kicks him right into an engine and kills him right on <laughs> yeah, the spot. Yeah. That is great yep. to me. Uh, and this film has nothing like that. No. Like the, the closest you get is Jason Momoa going, my boy, he's a backslap. Like that's kind of it, you know? Yeah. And it's just so serious. Like everything is serious about this. But again, it's exactly how the book is. There's no humor in the book at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Can't all be funny. I do appreciate zero nostalgia in this film. Not calling back to Dick. Like, it's not like like the new Ghostbusters Afterlife is, you know. Have you got, seen it? I have not seen it, but Me I've either. been told what happens in it, and it is just like, ugh. And then I watched this, the trailer for the new Spider-Man movie, and it's like they're asking, like. There's another Spider-Man movie? Yeah. And the premise of it is, what if it was only Easter eggs? That's basically it. It's a oh, multiverse movie. No. And so they're bringing back like the villains from different versions of Spider-Man movies. So you get like Dr. Ock from this one. And the rumor is other Spider-Mans played by like Tobey Maguire and the other one, Alexander Garfield, I think is the other dude, yeah. are going to pop up with Tom Holland. So you'll be able to have all the greatest hits of all the recent Spider-Man movies in one movie. I mean, that... Could, that could it, be they sort good. of do it in Enter the Spider Verse, which I love, which is super cool, and it just works. But it also has like the fucking black and white Nicolas Cage Spider Man. So weird, <laughs> so weird, so <laughs> great. The fact that they have Spider Ham yep. in it is also Why awesome. Why not? Um, I think what's fun about that is it's going into deep cuts. But the references for this are just like mainstream movies, which is kind of dull. Yeah, it's just yeah. But yes, this movie, the fact that it's self-contained. But you know, if I can sort of stretch my issue with that this is terrain we've been over Mm -hmm. ever since the book came out, and so it sort of lacks originality despite the fact that it's referring to something that was original, that is a way in which this movie feels to me that it is part of the issues we're having with nostalgia. Mm-hmm. That you can watch Dune 2021 and it would be foolish to complain too much about that it's too much like Star Wars. But that is a real issue because if we're feeling like this is too much like a movie that came out 35 years ago or for whatever... And that movie is based on earlier source material. There is an issue of originality happening. I was thinking about 
with Mer- Meredith's whole perspective on liking the new Texas Chainsaw more than the old Texas Chainsaw because she had seen the new Texas Chainsaw and sort of grew up with it. Yep. I feel like it would be totally valid to love Star Wars more than this. I mean, like, for example, if I saw any of these props in person, mm-hmm. I would think they were cool. I wouldn't have an unreasonable emotional reaction to them. I had an unreasonable emotional reaction to seeing Luke Skywalker's land speeder at the Peterson Museum. <laughs> like, it was like, I could not even, as cynical as I am about Star Wars now, yeah. I could not help myself. Right. I was so jubilant I like when I that. saw it. Like, um, and, and obviously it's a PSYOP designed to sell you toys. And that was one of the iconic toys. And there it is, big as life. You could sit on it if they wouldn't stop you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I don't think... Like nobody's getting Dune twenty twenty one's toys, you know. I don't well, know that they someone make. is. Well, dorks, <laughs> adult dorks are probably going to have like a you know the expensive expensive action figures or whatever. But all right. Well, speaking of adult dorks, um, I'm going to refer to uh, Red Letter Media again. I really kind of dug that a recent video they did. I don't even remember what it was about, but it sort of starts off with them going, have you seen Dune yet, though? But have you seen Dune? Yeah, but have you seen Dune? They just keep intersecting mm-hmm. as if you can't have a conversation without asking another person if they've seen Dune yet. And, of course, I work in a bar, and people want to know if they've seen Dune yet. <laughs> and so that's kind of part of my life. But I don't really know. Have you had conversations with people about this movie with people who never read the book? Yeah, several people. And do they like it? So a lot of them don't know what the fuck is going on. Yeah. And so I think that like... But do they like it? Are they like, that's cool though, I'll just just read Wikipedia. (laughs) You know, it reminded me of like when I was talking to people. I worked in a movie theater when Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet came out. And people would come out because it was a big movie. And, you know, whatever people want to feel cultured... But most people just don't get Shakespeare. It's hard. You yeah. know, it's weird to the modern ear. If you're not yeah. in, immersed in it, you don't know what the fuck's going on. Totally. And so I, it was very similar to that. Like, people were like, I think what I saw was great. I don't know what the fuck happened. Like, yeah. that. that's a certain group of people. Um, and then other people that I talked to who had not read the books or even seen the David Lynch version are just so immersed in the tropes of sci-fi then it made sense to them. Okay. You know, yeah. and, and and then there was a third group of people who I would consider my people, mostly engineers <laughs> that I work with, that had also grown up and were just like, what did you think? And, and those conversations are fun, but also we don't come to any different conclusions. Like our opinions were universally the same. If you wanted to know what it was like to talk to any engineer I work with about this movie, it's the exact same things I just said throughout this conversation. Right. Like, there was nobody had a radically different take on it, which I think is a bummer. Whereas like you could talk to people about the David Lynch Dune and people have radically different opinions about it. And that's just more fun. Yeah. Well, like, we were, I, I think we might be covering Teton next. Yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah. And like, there's a movie that everybody's got a very, very different, even if two people agree on it, they have very different takes. Yeah. It's hard uh, It's hard to have consistent viewpoints on that movie, you know? Yeah, I loved it. I think the Deadly Analysis guys loved it. You surprised me by not being in love with it. I don't know. We'll, we'll deal with that yeah, in another we'll episode. We'll but, but also, I'm going to watch it again. I could be complete. I could discover that I was wrong mm-hmm. on my first viewing. I will say, I've watched this film three times. Yeah. I don't think I will ever watch it again. I rewatched it last night and had... It did not add or subtract anything from my experience of watching it the first time. It was just as fun slash boring. And I don't mean boring because of pace. I mean boring because I barely know what's going on and I'm not particularly mm. invested. Um, yeah. Although one thing I know that I missed out on, it was interesting, uh, a friend of mine, asked me if I'd seen it in the theater and I said no. And I was like, oh, my, you know, my TV's pretty big and I know that's not the same, but it helps. And they were like, no, you're missing out because you didn't get to hear the score pounding the shit out of your body yeah. in a real theater. And that 
that could have been cool. I mean, last night I listened to it in headphone, really nice headphones, very cranked, and it actually enhanced the experience a lot. Yeah. But um, having my chest shaken by, you know, Hans Zimmer's very invested in low end. I might go see it in IMAX. I didn't see it in IMAX. It'd probably be pretty, It'd probably cool be pretty great. Yeah. But yeah, Hans Zimmer does so much with low end. You know, he, he the low end of the frequency spectrum, it's hard to create uh, complexity down there because it's such a wash. Mm-hmm. You know, the lower you go, the less definition there is. But he really takes a lot of care to work with really bass frequencies in a way that do a lot of different things. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, at least to my ears, I obviously I'm not, I'm not a Hans Zimmer scholar, but I feel like this score more than any other, he really went for it in that capacity, whether it was the sort of like, uh, low end chanting or this sort of like pitch down didgeridoo or these subsonic frequencies or these vibrations that are sort of like ships or just a, a planet's, uh, vibrations, that sort of thing. I thought that was uh, really arresting. Yeah, the uh, the liquefaction effect of the sand oh, beautiful. is very cool. So I thought good. that was really interesting. I thought the sandworms were fine. That's you good. Know? Yeah, like it, it, you just, you've seen so much sandworm uh, art yeah. over the years. It's just hard to, I mean, what are they going to do that's different? I mean, but our first threatening encounter with it, I thought that the, um, the, the first, basically the first action sequence really, mm-hmm. uh, when they rescue the, um, the mining ship or I don't know what the, what they're called. The spice but, harvester. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a great, it was a, you know, good tension, good action sequence. Thought it totally worked. That action sequence to me is a really both in the book and there, it's a very boring action sequence because it's like, it's so regimented. They know exactly how much time everything takes. And the whole idea of like Paul running off and kind of getting lost doesn't totally happen in the book. Hmm. I think it, it adds tension, but like there's never any doubt that they're going to be able to pick up and lift the people off. And then the word and spice, I'm the only, the, the tension of the scene is, and this is not doesn't come across in the film at all, is just how much money is lost by the spice harvester. Like so, to lose that spice harvester at that moment while they're trying to like take, basically like ensure that they've got control of the planet, is a bigger deal than the threat of the action is, and it just doesn't come across. I mean, in the film, it's the first time you see the worm, so it's kind of a big, it's a big moment, right. but. Um, the significance of it isn't that the worm is there. Like he just, it, it's, it's kind of weird. Um, and that's something that's not in the book, in any of the films is Duke Leto's reign as short as it is, like how it happens. There's like a really long dinner scene with a bunch of different like power factions of Arrakis, you know, like smugglers and, and guildsmen and shit like that, that, um, that takes a long time in the book that no one has filmed. I think probably for good reason. It, it would probably be done on screen. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of politics in the book that I think a certain type of person who likes that sort of thing might be the thing. Like, that, I really like that in a book. Like, I like, you know, like I like Russian literature that takes place across several generations. And, you know, that's interesting to me. That I don't think that'll ever be filmed. Right. Probably shouldn't be. But I don't have much else to say about this film. I think we've exhausted this topic. Looks great. Is cool. Sounds great. Definitely we'll watch the second one. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to like come away from a movie that's this, again, perfect and mm-hmm. feel somehow disappointed. But I also don't... I, I mean, I don't want to overstate the disappointment factor. It's... The, the movie's great i guess for myself it's just uh it's just not my thing it's sort of like if we were doing an episode about a john wayne western mm-hmm. like even then i think that there's there's mistakes that are interesting there's kitsch factor that you could go back to over and over and over again with the john wayne movie that you might not with this like mm. like to me it's hilarious that john wayne played genghis khan <laughs> like it's as fucked up as it sounds, you yeah. know. And there's something about that 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 is just sort of more compelling. Like for example, I think the Jodorowsky Dune documentary, I could watch that 
tonight. It's incredible. Like just I and I, I, I dear I, listeners, watch that fucking movie. Yeah. It's called Jodorowsky's Dune. And it is part of <laughs> the canon of movies about great art failures. Yeah. Which is uh, but, so fascinating to well, I mean, I'm I'm invested in it, especially like I'm mm-hmm. an artist, so I'm always trying not to fail, you know, and to watch movies about like how titanically huge failures can be mm-hmm. when creating something. It's devastating and fascinating where things can go wrong. This one had like a unique impact, though, like in the explosion of this film sent these like creative spores across the film industry. I yep. mean... You don't, I mean, maybe you get these films, but you don't get the look of Alien. You don't get Alien. Without Jodorowsky's Dune. Totally. Um, There's all this influence of Mebius as an artist that probably might not have been as big. There's script writers, there's cinematographers, there's all these people who were attached to this film that didn't get made that went on to make every other significant film from like the late 70s to the 90s yeah um it's still influencing people i mean look at uh the woman that directed girl walks home alone at night like she's influenced by jodorowsky yeah and probably she's probably i would say probably more influenced by like the films that people know yeah you know but um i don't know why they haven't made a fucking coffee table book of the bible yeah you know like that there's there's that book it just went out for auction one one of the copies, there's like six copies of it, and one of them just went up for auction. I think it sold for like fifty thousand dollars or something <laughs> like that. I can't believe it sold for that little. It's such a. I mean, you can buy like like a fifth never used broken bullshit lightsaber for like four hundred thousand dollars, but this absolutely important piece of art goes for like fifty. It's just it's weird. Yeah, it's weird. It needs to be reproduced. I would pay a thousand bucks for like a big crazy like it looks exactly like his version of it yeah. version of it uh if if like passion or somebody made that i would i would for sure buy it yeah all right is that it yeah that's it what have we learned um i don't know do better do better all right again you can email us at what the at scarythoughts.org we've been getting a lot of great emails lately thanks everybody really appreciate it and those emails are partly why we ended up covering dune and a lot of people did ask us if we would be covering Titan, which i believe will be next and yeah keep in touch y'all word thanks for listening could have probably talked about my obsession with David Lynch and transcendental meditation, but that's just too much.